So here's what we're going to cover today. Um, we're going to talk about integrated pest management, which is a real smart way to take care of uh, the problems in your house and in your garden. It, um, it gives you a nice stepwise, sensible, usable program to use. We're going to talk about the insect's life cycles, which sounds like why should I have to know that, but there's a reason for it. Then we'll go into spiders and pests that you find usually in your kitchen and around your home, and then some of those seasonal visitors, like I know some of you are very interested in. Um, we, almost all of us end up with ant problems at some time during the year, and uh, bed bugs we're going to touch upon. I've actually seen a lot more of those in the last couple of years than I've ever seen, so that's something that we, we want to talk about. So we have a free plant and insect clinic. I think those of you who know us know that we will answer any questions you have about insects, about plant problems, growing problems. And we have a website that will um, you can upload your questions and your uh, photos. And um, I'll put that up in the chat box as well. That's collitzcomg.com and then plant and insect clinic. And it looks like this. And then you can go to um, what kind of problem you have. We're on Facebook. So if you're on Facebook, look for Collett's Master Gardeners. We post a lot of interesting things up there as well as the, um, the notifications for this, these different talks. So just a quick how to. If you're submitting specimens to us, which nobody's been able to do since COVID because we're not in the office, um, if it squishes like a, like a uh, fly or a, a spider, stick it in a jar with a little vinegar or alcohol. Don't freeze it. But if it crunches, put it in a jar or bag and freeze it. Because live ones, uh, we can't look at them under a scope. And if you stick it to paper or stick it to tape, it's um, we really really can't use it under a scope at all. So we're going to be looking at insects life cycles and why do we have to know this? Well there are some really good reasons. The immature forms of some insects might not even look like the adults. Think about caterpillars. I mean you see a caterpillar on your on whatever and you know that it's a moth or a butterfly but you don't think about that. They look, sometimes you might not even recognize it as that. But the other thing is there may be a certain part of their life cycle in which they are not a problem, but they, there's a part of their life cycle where they can cause a lot of damage. And that's why we have to know the life cycles. Um, and some insects may be susceptible to the different chemical treatments that we may be able to use only during certain parts of their life cycles. So we're going to be talking about, we're taking you back now to um, high school biology. Incomplete metamorphosis, which is the, the stages where there's an egg, which hatches into a nymph, which is basically a little mini-me of the, the adult. And there are usually several different forms. Every time they grow, they, they shed their skin and get a little bit bigger, and they might look a little bit different. And each of these stages is called an instar. And eventually, they become an adult. Um, true bugs like, um, like uh, stink bugs and box elder bugs, they are... In, they have incomplete metamorphosis. Grasshoppers, when grasshoppers hatch, the grasshoppers come out and they look like teensy tiny little grasshoppers. Same thing with praying mantises and termites. They, there may be some differences, but they do resemble the adults when they, are, uh, when they hatch. And here are some other examples. Look at the bed bugs. They go from egg to the first instar, shed their skin, second instar, shed their skin, and all the way up to the adult. Grasshoppers, on the other hand, the only thing that gets bigger here are their wings. But they look you could tell by looking at it that it's a little grasshopper. And here's a couple more. Here's pretty much all the life cycle or life stages of the box elder bug. Um, you see these little egg and they hatch into this little this little red thing. And if you've ever been out working in your garden in the summer, if you've had these insects like 
last year and you're working out in your garden, you'll see all these different stages of the nymphs playing around in your garden in the soil, or not in the soil, kind of under the plants. And this is the brown marmorated stink bug. Take a good look at this guy because he's coming to a garden near you and possibly in your house as a hitchhiker on your cat um, or your dog. This is what they look like, the eggs look like before they hatch. They're very tiny. And this is what the, the first instar looks like. It looks like a little tiny red and black spider. I mean, that that is not true to size. It's very, very tiny. And then it gets up to the stink bug that we all know and hate. Now, the complete metamorphosis are uh, moths and uh, butterflies. Uh, bees, ants, mosquitoes, they go from egg and then into uh, larvae, which are the, the young, they hatch that way. Then they go into a resting stage where a miracle occurs and they come out looking completely different than they did before. Could everybody please um, mute your mics? We're getting some feedback. Um, and here are some examples of complete, complete metamorphosis. And I'm sure you recognize these. The maggots, we call those maggots. Then they go to the pupa and then into the adult fly. We call these chrysalis, uh, chrysalis. And this we just plain call a pupa, but they are all pupa. Pupae, actually. Let's see. So ladybugs. And I know this is for inside bugs, but I wanted to show you this too. Um, ladybugs, since they're beetles, they undergo complete metamorphosis. They go from egg to larva. Take a look at that. I've had people bring these into the plant and insect clinic in this stage and in the pupil stage, and they think that they've got some horrible thing all over their plant. And when actually these, these are great little aphid eaters. And then they go into the resting stage, and then they hatch into uh, the, the adult not hatch, they emerge from the, the uh, pupa as the adult. Now, this is a very practical way of handling problems both in the home and in the garden. The first thing you need to do is to identify the pest, and that's what we're here for. The plant and insect clinic, if you, if you give us good pictures or a good specimen and fill out one of the forms on our website, we can let you know what you're working with. And once you've got that, we can give you the information that will help you take care of it the rest of the way. We'll let you know about the pest life cycle and, you know, when they're most vulnerable. Then we'll, you'll have to monitor and sample the environment for the pest population. Really, how many do you have there? Where are they? Are they just in the kitchen? Are they in the living room, in the bathroom? And then you have to decide how much can you stand. In the garden, that's pretty easy. Usually you, you know, you could break off a couple of the branches that are covered with the, the insects and get rid of them. In the home, it's a little bit different. In the home, you really want to get on it um, if it's a, a true pest that's eating something in your house as opposed to just the, you know, somebody who wandered in. And, and there, it's important to be able to know the difference. And once you've decided what you can tolerate, there are ways to take care of the problem, and there are things that, uh, you know, you can use as a very last resort, a pesticide, but there are a lot of other things you can do. And once you've used these appropriate management tactics, then you see if it works. You monitor the results, evaluate and monitor the results, and then you go back and start the whole thing over again and keep your eyes open to make sure that the, the problem is taken care of. And everything I show you tonight as far as um, taking care of the problems, we always, always choose non-chemical options first. For one thing, chemical options might take care of the immediate problem, but they're not going to take care of the cause of your problem, which means that if you spray something, it's going to come back. So we always talk about the physical tools, how to take, get rid of it and, and watch for it ways to change the environment, the cultural tools, access to water, some of their hiding places, we want to get rid of those. Um, we don't use biological tools so much in the home. It's more uh, 
the pheromone traps are for outside, well, except for one. Chemical tools, pheromones, there's a couple of really good ones we can use in the home, and it's safe around food. When you are using chemical controls, you've got to make sure that you choose the right pesticide. And if, you're, if you use Pest Sense, which is the, um, and some of the other, the other resources that I'm going to give you later, you can look, at, look these insects up, or we can help you with that. We'd be more than happy to help you with that. And we'll give you the options for the pesticide. There are a lot of um, organic pesticides out there that are, those would be the ones, if you're going to start using uh, chemical controls, we'd want you to start with that. And it's important to make sure that the insect that you are treating for is actually listed on that label. And it's also important to make sure that you uh, read the label. And I'm not just saying that, it's the law. Um, but also, you protect yourself if you're following directions. Um, you use too much, it could be toxic to everything around you, and more does not mean better. Just follow the directions. They, the, the people that made that know how it works the best. Obviously, you're not going to want to eat or smoke, you know, when you're applying chemicals. And if you look down at the very bottom, it, this isn't so important in a home because it's not going to be for outside for the most part. But we actually have tools out there to help you make the right choices for um, insecticides used in the garden to protect the pollinators. They will rate these, list the, um, the different chemicals in the pesticides that we can buy here in Washington, and they'll tell us um, what we can do to mitigate the the damage to uh, pollinators and other beneficial insects. This is pest sense. This WSU offers this site and it's really, really good. Um, I'm going to take us there for a moment. This is what it looks like. You'll have, um, I put our, this whole talk up on our website and you'll be able to click this link and I'd suggest that you save it because it's wonderful. So you go to pest sense and you go to um, fact sheets. And then you can see here, there's a list of things. So let's go to nuisance. And let's go to box elder bugs. They're not there. Oh, yes, they are. Western box elder bug. It will give you the biology, which is the life cycle, what to worry about, non-chemical management, chemical management, and then it gives pictures. It does that for every single insect that it's got listed. So um, it's a really, really great tool to use. It doesn't have everything, but if there's something that you're concerned about that's not there you make, and you know for sure that it's not there, then give us a call. We'd be more than happy to help you with that. So let's get on to the visitors. Spiders. That's our favorite one in the fall. But, you know, it's not an insect. And if you had to compare it, the life cycle, it would be more like incomplete metamorphosis. But again, it's not an insect. When baby spiders hatch from eggs, they are little bitty baby mini-me's, and then they get bigger and bigger. And this time of year, a lot of them are um, procreating, and sometimes the males come into the house looking for females, and they are just running around like crazy. And that's when you see them. Yeah, let's go here. Everybody's concerned about the hobo spider. I, uh, this is not a hobo spider. If you see two stripes, it's a grass spider. It's from the same family. It's a funnel weaver spider, but it's not a hobo spider. Uh, other people will see this spider. It's a little bit larger, too, and it's kind of got orangish, shiny legs, and it's not a hobo spider. You can cut, just kind of write those off right away, but... I can tell you this, too. We have no brown root recluse spiders in Washington, regardless of what somebody may have told you. Even a doctor, a health care provider, doesn't really have the knowledge to be able to, well, not the knowledge, he, the, the health care provider can't diagnose a spider bite based on how it looks because there is a list of about 40 different things that can cause this, the um, skin reaction that people sometimes think are spider bites. So, 
we have giant house spiders in our house right now, and we have hobos. The hobos are actually smaller. People think, you know, bigger is worse. And so they'll bring us these huge giant house spiders into the house and tell us, ask us, oh my gosh, you know, are those the hobo? No, actually, the, the, these large giant house spiders eat the hobos. And it's great news to all of us. The hobo spider's venom truly is no more dangerous than any other uh, spider venom. And spiders, all of them, true spiders, all true spiders have venom, but they don't want to bite you. You know, I mean, you're, they're looking for prey. If, if you get in their way or they get trapped in your clothes, they'll bite you. If they have teeth that are strong enough, to, or not teeth, fangs big enough to be able to uh, penetrate your skin, a lot of times they can't. And most of the time when they do penetrate your skin, they don't inject venom. So here's the thing. For somebody to say that, yes, I got a spider bite, you actually had to see that spider bite you. And then an expert has to identify the spider species. And I can tell you from experience, when I get a spider bite, and I have seen myself being bitten by a spider, I, or it can be a, um, a yellow jacket, I've gotten uh, mosquito bites, I swell up like crazy. I will end up with a sore on my arm from a spider bite that won't go away for probably three weeks. I've gotten bitten by fleas, and, and I don't scratch them. But those flea bites will stay on my skin like that, the skin lesion, for at least a month. I just, I'm highly allergic to it. But the problem with a lot of these things are people scratch them, and then they get that met, uh, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, that, that MRSA, the flesh-eating uh, bacteria, and that can cause one heck of a skin infection. And it's so common that they call it the false spider bite diagnosis. So here's a look. This is the giant house spider. The first one I ever saw out here, uh, somebody brought it in in a mason jar. No, it was a mayonnaise jar, but same thing. Took the lid off because it had been in the refrigerator. It was kind of slow. And its legs filled the entire jar and then some. It was, the leg, the spread was huge, way over three inches. I think I know I told the story on the, my spider talk, but I'll tell it again really quick. In the um, plant and insect clinic, we've got this wonderful microscope, and to identify a spider positively, you actually have to look at uh, different parts of the body that are pretty hard to see without magnification. Like this one's on its back right now, and this is the sternum right here. And looking at the sternum is one way we can actually distinguished between a uh, hobo spider and a giant house spider. Anyhow, we put this spider in alcohol, rubbing alcohol, and it makes them drunk, kind of sleepy, but they don't move. So we stuck it under the scope so we could look at its um, sternum, and we're looking on this huge screen, you know, it's like a 32-inch screen, and it's not moving, and all of a sudden it moved, and the, the ma master gardener I was with and I, we, we nearly went through the roof because we weren't expecting something like that to jump at us. Anyhow, it, it was, you know, I like being startled. Yeah. Anyhow, you can see the difference here. And another thing, they look very similar in characteristics, just the body itself. But you can't judge um, a spider by looking at the coloration or markings because they're so highly variable. And this is another common spider. We don't have the yellow sack spider in our side, but Jenny over in uh, Western Washington, you probably have it. These are the two um, really poisonous spiders in our state. But the brown recluse spider, or not, the um, black widow spider is very shy, and you'll find it in hidden spaces in, you know, crawl spaces and under your deck and places like that. And Unless you, if, unless you bother them, unless you um, interfere with them in some way, they're not going to bite you. So let's move on to pantry pests. You know, uh, somebody sent in, uh, brought in a, I don't know, it was, I think it was a carpet beetle, and they said, 
I don't know what this is, but it must have come in on the dog, but there's a lot of them because I keep a really clean house. That has nothing to do with anything. Um, most of these things come in on food that you buy. I'll tell you a story, real quick story. Um, my husband and I used to spend our winters down in Florida, and my sisters lived there. Everybody came over for a Sunday dinner, and I was making pasta. And we, you know, I'm not from Florida. I don't really know Florida. But we went to the store and bought a box of some kind of a pasta. And I'm talking to my family. I've got the water boiling on the stove. And I dump in the pasta. And there's all these bugs floating on top of the boiling water. I Oh, I almost had a heart attack. Um, my husband saw it. And I didn't want to say anything to anybody because we really didn't have any more pasta in the house. I already had the sauce. Everybody was there. So we drained it. We rinsed them off. We put in um, new water, and then we just boiled up the pasta. And there weren't any little pieces there because I'm a vegetarian. I'm very careful about that. And nobody was the wiser, but it was it was quite a shock. And apparently that's not unusual for um, the pasta in the grocery stores, even the really good grocery stores with quick turnover, to have, um, I'm not even sure what those were because I screamed and... <laughs> yeah, anyway, I didn't look at them too closely. So how to keep them out of your kitchen? The thing is, you've got to find out where they're from, or where, what they came in on, where they are. And if you go through your pantry, look around, pull everything out. Sometimes you'll see flour, you know, laying on the bottom of the shelf. That's probably where they are. But then the thing that we'll tell you to do as far as general management is to check all your foods and clean everything. Get everything out of your cupboards. There is no easy fix for this. Get everything out of your cupboards. Vacuum in the corners. Get hot water and the detergent. Wipe everything down. And then, then you have to check all the foodstuffs but we'll get into that. Some of the other things you can do is keep dry pet foods away from the general pantry area and in a very tightly sealed container. Pests can get into most cardboard packaging like they did at the, like those bugs that we had in the pasta. So make sure that you so store foodstuffs in tightly sealed containers, that, especially if they're not going to be used sometime in the future. When COVID hit, my husband went out and bought a whole bunch of you know, these quick meals like macaroni and cheese. And then the first thing we did was get them into plastic containers where nothing can get them because we're storing them in the garage. And that's just like an invitation to pests and mice. So here are some of the things that you actually might see in your kitchen. I've seen people bring these in. And here's the relative size. They are pretty tiny. So it's this is the size of the top of a push pin. Right, that's a big picture, but they're very, very tiny. And the drugstore beetle is another one. That it's a frequent offender. And it's also very tiny, like the tip of a matchstick tiny. That's how small they are. And if you find them, you can get pictures with your cell phone pretty easily, but those are ones that you may want to freeze and drop off at the office. Uh, Gary Fredericks would just love to put them in the freezer for us. We also see the larder beetle. It's a little bit bigger. It's a quarter of an inch. See, but here's the thing. You see the adults. You may not see the adults. You may see these, the, the, the uh, pupa or the, um, the larva or the eggs. So that's why you want to get on pest sense and start looking around. And if not, contact us. And the same... And, you know, criteria for management uh, works with these. You have to check out the food stuff. Um, one time I went to uh, a co-op in our neighborhood when I lived in Ohio, and I brought home some flour. And it, it looked fine. I used it. And, you know, I kept it in my just a regular old flour jar on the counter. And I don't know, about two months later, we started seeing these little things in the corners of the room, and I'll show you a picture of it later. 
And then we started seeing these little moths flying around. And we had a heck of a time getting rid of them, but they came in on that flower. So when you shop at Winco and you buy their bulk stuff, the first thing you're going to do is bring it home and stick it in the freezer for two days. That'll kill any, um, usually will kill any eggs or larvae that are in there. And if you don't know about it, you're okay. Here's some more pantry pests, and these are very tiny too. We've seen a lot of the rice weevil. And we, weevils are in the beetle family, but look at that long snout they have. That's how you can tell it's a weevil. They're also very small, very tiny. And the same thing, you know, same way to take care of them. They'll go into rice and, and cereals, other cereals. This is the one that is unbelievably hard to get rid of if it gets established. So make sure it doesn't get established in your house. And if it does, take care of it as soon as you can. They're about half an inch long when the adults are about half an inch long. And they've got bicolored wings, but you'll never see that because they fly so fast. Um, the caterpillars have that, that dark head, and you might see those crawling on your walls. They pupate in the corners of your walls like this. They're little white things that you might not even see because your ceiling's white and their cocoon is white. And the larva, it's a little bitty maggot-sized worm, and it, um, it is also the same color as your ceiling, so you probably wouldn't see it. They will lay their eggs in uh, areas where your flour, beans, nuts, cereal, fried, dried fruit, bird seed, oatmeal, chocolate, just about anything, pet food, and um, bird seed. That's another big one. They fly at night, and they're attracted to light, so you can catch them that way. But the problem is you've got to catch it early. One of these adult females can lay up to 400 eggs at a time, and there are no natural predators in your home to take care of them. Now, the cats will watch them, but they don't do anything. Um, I had a friend who stored their bird seed in her laundry room. She had nice built-in cabinets, and she kept them in one of the bigger ones underneath the sink in there. And she started noticing these things flying around. And six months later, after cleaning out the cupboard, she took everything out. She had to take all the drawers out of the um out of her cabinet. Her husband had to take the baseboards out and the bottom of the cabinet out so she could run the vacuum back in there because they had laid eggs and and had huge families back in there too. It took her six to eight months to get rid of them all. Uh, one of the things, one of the best things you can do, well, prevention is the best. When you bring anything home that you're not going to use right away, make sure that it is stored in a sealed plastic container. Anytime I go to the store, if I buy a box of pasta, anything, ever since my, you know, working in the plant and insect clinic, but ever since my experience in Florida, I stick everything in the freezer. I've got one half of a shelf dedicated for that. I'll put a note on my calendar to take them out after two days, and I have never had a problem since. I, I never want to. Um, they sell sticky traps that have a pheromone in them that attract the males to the sticky traps. It's just, you know, a piece of cardboard with sticky stuff on it. And that will go a long way in trapping the males, which means the females won't be able to lay eggs. But that's not the only thing that can take care of it. You've got to get in there with a vacuum cleaner and probably a scrub brush for the corners because the uh, cocoons are very, very sticky. And you've got to, every single day, you've got to go in there, wipe everything down, vacuum, whatever you see when you've got to be at it. So Prevention. Prevention is the key. That's the only way to go. And, you know, when we tell folks, well, you have to clean out your pantry, well, isn't there something we can spray? Nope, there really isn't. Uh, we don't recommend using most uh, pesticides in the home because your food's there. But the other thing is, if you don't clean out your pantry, you're not going to find the source of the problem. You've got to clean them out. And you can discard infested food things. Sometimes you can save some of them, but, yeah, I throw them out. Um, I don't know how we've actually covered all the stuff on that. 
this is what you're going to be seeing this winter. We've already seen quite a few of these. And these are carpet beetles. And this is the one that we see most of. The larvae is about, oh, about a half an inch, maybe. And he's fuzzy, kind of funny looking. Looks like a Halloween mask. And the adults are very small. They look to the naked eye like teeny tiny white and brown uh, uh, ladybugs. They aren't, though, obviously. And they, can, they usually fly in from outside somewhere. But if they find a place in your house, they'll stay. And they can, once they're there, they're really hard to get rid of. Um, they're attracted to animal products like furs and woolens and feathers and animal collections that you might have. If you have wool sweaters and things like that that you don't wear very often, then you'll want to put those in something, a moth-proof container. The other thing that they're attracted to is body sweat. So if you've worn your clothes, well, you know, a lot of people wear their clothes twice, and sometimes they forget, and they just, you know, they'll leave it in the closet, and you can't smell anything. They seem okay, but the um, carpet beetles are attracted to them. You, you want to never put anything that you've worn back on a, a hanger into your closet. We don't see these very often, but uh, we do sometimes. If birds make a nest up in your attic or under your eaves, and there's a way for them to get in your house, possibly, they can have bird mites. And the bird mites, after the birds leave, if they can come into your house, they will bite you, and they will suck your blood. Now, they can't reproduce because they don't do, they can't live on your blood. You'll end up with some, uh, you know, some itchy bites, but they will die in about two weeks. So if you have them and you see them, you can clean them up, but they'll, they'll die on their own as long as there are no birds around. What you can do is bird-proof your house, of course, um, and this this will go for later, too. Any opening you have, make sure you close it up. Trim the trees away from the house so that the birds aren't real close to it. Get rid of abandoned nest, nests as soon as you can and uh, vacuum the house and make sure you clean out your vacuum cleaner bag if you do have a problem, and again, wipe stuff up. And the good thing about them is if this happens in the summer or the winter when you've got the heat or air conditioning on, they'll desiccate, they'll dry up, and that they'll, get rid of, they'll leave your house very quickly that way. They'll die. They'll just shrivel up and die. So I know some of you were concerned about this. Gary, do you have your poll? about these guys? Yeah, let me launch that. Okay. Everybody see it? So just go ahead and put your um, cursor on the one that uh, you'd like to select, and you can select any of them. Problem with this year, or problems with this year, uh, stink bug, box elders, sugar ants, and carpenter ants. And so far, nobody has voted. Up, oh, one person voted. Three. Wait for a few more. Sounds like there hasn't been much of a problem this year. Yep. I'll wait just for 10 more seconds. Okay, five people. I'm going to go ahead and cut it off, and this is what we had. Pretty well. So we had stink bugs, box elder bugs, sugar ants, and carpenter ants, and that's exactly what I've had, too. So you can click close on that to get it off your screen. Whoops. And go back. So we've got the box elder bugs. You may have seen one or two of these out on your deck. Um, the western conifer seed bug, they don't do any harm. They're just kind of wandering around. If you live out like I do where there's a lot of wooded areas, they just kind of wander in from there. Brown marmorated stink bug, I haven't seen nearly as many of those in this last year, or box elder bugs for that matter, which is really good. Um, common black brown beetle, they'll come in sometimes too, usually if you have a room at ground level. 
earwigs, everybody has seen those. They like to live in the tracks of your sliding doors. And Asian lady beetles. Um, I, I haven't seen many of them this year, but we've had problems with them coming into homes other years. These guys, you know, people say, well, are they beneficial like the, you know, the regular lady beetles are? Yeah, they are. Their larvae will eat a ton of aphids. So until they come into your house, they aren't a problem. But they will smell if you leave the house. I told you we uh, used to go to Florida in the wintertime. And we lived up on Green Mountain Road in Kalama at about 1,500 feet. And we had a new place. And I hadn't had a chance to find out where all the holes were with things coming in. And we, we left in November. And I came home in December for my grandson's birthday here. And when I walked into the house, I crunched with every step I took. There were Asian lady beetles, box elder bugs, brown marmorated stink bugs, and these doggone black beetles all over the floors. So um, they, they will come into the house, and there are ways to take care of them, but we'll talk about that. Now, the box elder bugs, I think that's the next. Let me see. Yeah, let's go back. We'll start with the um, brown marmorated stink bug. There is some hope here with the brown marmorated stink bug. I, for one, uh, where we live, last year we had a terrible problem with them. They were everywhere. They were on, we have a, the back of our house faces south. The sun hits it. It warms up the house, and we were attracting hundreds of these. And um, the, the bad part about it is they'd get caught in the cat's fur, and the cats would drag them in, and we'd have to run around with a vacuum cleaner and suck them all up. They don't, they don't hurt anything. They don't want to be in your house. They'll die in the house, but they come in anyway. And again, take a good look at what the uh, nymphs, the young ones, look like because you'll be able to recognize them in your garden and get rid of them before they become adults, lay eggs, and more hatch. I didn't put that in there. There's a new... Um, predator of these brown marmorated stink bugs that um, they've discovered. We act, it's a, a samurai. It's a samurai wasp. It's a little teeny tiny parasitic wasp, and it'll lay its eggs, it'll lay its eggs in the brown marmorated stink bugs' eggs, and it kills them. And there have been some found in Portland or in Oregon somewhere, maybe not Portland, and it could be that they're moving north now, and maybe that's why I haven't seen that many this year. Maybe the natural predators are starting to take care of the brown marmorated stink bug. If you find them in your house, vacuum them up, but make sure that you empty the vacuum bag because they will smell. It's, I don't find it an unpleasant smell. Some people do. It's kind of like a cross between a, a bleach solution and, and cilantro. It's not particularly pleasant, but it's not bad, but I wouldn't want it in my vacuum cleaner bag either. Now, here's the box elder bugs, and again, I haven't had that much of a problem this year, and I have other years, but they can cover the entire back of your house so that it looks black from a distance, um, and it usually happens when you have the real hot, dry summers, then followed by warm springs, you know, through the winter, and we had that last year, and come spring, they'll go, they kind of go into hibernation and they'll hide in the, um, like in your siding and we have a roll up, um, a roll up shade on our deck and they'll go up in there and they'll, they'll protect themselves there. But come spring, a nice warm spring day when the sun hits the back of my house, they'll come out again and then we'll go back into hiding until it's summer again. Um, so what you want to do is button up all the possible points of entry with with um, steel wool, you know, like where the electricity and the water comes into your house, and usually they drill the hole a little bit bigger than they need to. Check out, under, if you can, check out underneath your siding where, they, where it meets there. Chances are you're not going to be able to get it all. But you should be able to clean up around your windows and do that too. There is a way, I don't know if I've, yeah, let's go. You can get a perimeter spray if they are really bad and they're coming in your house like crazy. I, I really hesitate to recommend any kind of a pesticide, but I, I ended up having to use one when we went to Florida in the winter. 
if you, there's a couple of products out there. One of is Ortho Home Defense, and uh, Bayer has one, and Raid has one. They're called perimeter sprays, and you you spray around your windows. Or I don't spray. I actually um, put gloves on and, and wear my glasses or goggles, and uh, saturate it with that. And I run the uh, run it around my uh, my windows, but I'll spray around the base of the house and at the doors. And when I did that, the next year when we went to Florida, I didn't have anything in my house. It really works. And the thing is, you're using it late in the year, so you're not really harming um, beneficial insects like you would be if you were going to be using it in the uh, real active season. And the pollinators won't get hurt because there's no flowers there. So I, I didn't feel too bad using it. But if you're really desperate, if you've really got a problem, then that'll work. Then there are the moisture-loving ones. Um, if you see any of these, you probably have th these little drain flies. Then you probably have water sitting in your sink. And y you can cover them up. Yeah, you can cover up the sink. You can pour some hot water down. That, that will help. But mostly they're just a nuisance. And then you've seen millipedes a million times. We had a problem with millipedes this year, though. Usually they're just, you know, they, they're just kind of there. Same thing with the pill bugs and the sow bugs. They're, they're just there. They don't cause any problem. But the uh, millipedes this year were all over the strawberry plants in the garden. So I, I don't know what the deal was this year that was different, but it was a problem. But normally, just sweep these up and put them in the trash. And they won't come into your house if you use the, um, the Ortho Home Defense or one of those other ones. Yeah, I think it's Bayer Advanced Home Pest Control is the name of the other one. Ants are probably the most frequent ones we see, and the odorous house ant is the one that shows up in May. Pavement ants aren't as much of a problem, and carpenter ants, for the most part, just kind of wander in when they're um, in mating mode. These are the, the uh, odorous house ant that people call sugar ants, and they usually show up in May, and you see them on your door, on your windowsill for some reason. And there are very easy ways to take care of them. First, you've got to wipe things down because the way that they, the ants telegraph where food is, they drop their butt and they leave scent traps everywhere. There are scent tracks everywhere they walk. So if you wipe down the area where they're at, the other ones will get lost, and that helps to control them too. Usually it's not enough. And, well, clean up your kitchen. Don't let any crumbs anywhere. Um, this taro, and there's another brand too, but taro, it has borax, and it's a, it, it's pretty innocuous. It's a, um, bi, it's a uh, organic insecticide. If you follow the instructions, and there's traps. I happen to like this one. It's a, a liquid, a bottle of liquid, a real tiny bottle, and I'll just put like a dime size drop where I see the ants. And within probably an hour, you'll have 40, 50 of them kind of around it like it's an oasis, and they're just slurping away, and then they take it back to their nest. It may take a week to get rid of them, but they'll be gone. And But you still have to wipe things up because if you don't, they'll be back. The pavement ants, are, um, they're more of a nuisance. They usually don't come inside. They don't usually nest in the house. If they, if you have a raised bed and they're in your raised bed, you're probably in trouble because they're really hard to get rid of. Um, you can use the chemical options here, uh, gels and granules, but I, I don't have that specific information. We would have to get that for you. Carpenter ants. Most of the time we see carpenter ants probably May, June, July, when they come in, the, the queens and the uh, males with wings, they're just kind of wandering around. They're not really scoping things out. They're just not paying a lot of attention. Unless you see a lot of them, you can just ignore it, just you know, sweep them up or whatever. But there are two kinds. Okay, what do ants eat? Here we go. Gary, here's another poll. I was actually surprised at this. What do ants eat? Choose as many as you think they eat.
How are we doing, Gary? We have two people. Nobody knows who's voting. This is anonymous. It's strictly anonymous, yeah. It just shows totals. Four people, five. Anybody else? Six. Make sure you hit submit. Okay, five more seconds. Okay, well, the only thing they don't eat is wood. Believe that? They don't eat wood. They'll eat living and dead insects, meats, uh, sweet stuff that you leave laying around the house, and they love honeydew that the aphids make. So you can click closed and it'll go off your screen. Um, what they do with the wood is they, they excavate with it, so they're the... It's sawdust that they're actually um, pushing out of the holes. That They excavate into the wood so that they can uh, lay their eggs. There are two kinds of carpenter ant nests. There, uh, there are parent nests and then there are satellite nests. And they don't eat wood. What you want to do is avoid dense shrubbery. You don't want um, wood and soil to come in contact with each other. Uh, if, if you've got shrubbery outside, don't let it touch your house. Um, don't let the soil touch the wood of your house. They like uh, finely shredded bark mulch and don't have stumps or logs near the house. The parent nests are usually found in moisture decayed woods, but the um, satellite nests can be uh, other places. Okay. So this is what you might see. It would look like this. I would suggest probably, if you have them in your home, I would suggest getting a licensed pesticide operator because they can be places that you can't see and these folks would know what they're doing. If there's just a few and you don't really think that they're in your house, then you can try the, you know, the ortho home defense or one of the, um, the ant killer concentrates like we saw for the uh, sugar ants. But I think you probably need a pesticide operator. Alan, yes. Just a, a short story. I, I had in one of my homes, I had a small hole and sawdust was coming out and would wipe it away and after the fourth or fifth day I realized the sawdust was coming out and so um, on a continual basis so I called the exterminator and they went around and sprayed all around the house they put it in in the house and they then they sprayed right where that hole was at and it must have dropped somewhere between 500 and 600 carpet drants it was just it was like a, it was like it was raining and they were coming out that hole um, and uh, I would have never believed there'd be that many there. So the fact that you even see one or two doesn't mean there's only a few there. You really want to respond to them um, because it doesn't take long for them to make up shop once you, you have something going on. Thanks, Alice. Thank you, Gary. So if you see sawdust, yeah, you've got a problem. If you see the... Um, the uh, the winged ants in May or June, just a few of them wandering in your house, chances are you don't have a problem. They're just wandering around. But the difference between them, the ants have that little pinched waist and just regular unequal wings that most insects have, and the termites look like this, and their wings are longer than their bodies. And they swarm in early September, and they, they'll come on your deck. They'll be a, a attracted to the light, and the your cats will take their wings off and eat them. At least mine do. My cats are weird. So bed bugs. This is our final insect. Um, bed bugs will feed on humans and on animals. And once you have them, they're really difficult to get rid of. They don't transmit disease. And they live in the furniture where you sleep, where you sit watching TV. That's where they stay because that's where their meal is. They come out at night and because you don't see them during the day very much. Chances are, if you've got bed bugs, you look around and you see things like this, and looking closer, you see that, or a little bit of dirty stuff here, or in the joints of your bed, 
then call an exterminator because they, they'll be able to take care of it. Um, don't try to take care of it yourself. If you do that, they, they'll move someplace else that you didn't know about. And if you find them, call somebody right away. Let them come in before you disturb, disturb where they are right now. Um, you can destroy them. You can get rid of things that you've perhaps caught from, um, brought home from traveling by putting them, search your laundry before you come home in plastic bags. And anything that you've got in your suitcase goes into the plastic bags, you know, lights and darks, delicates and whatever. And as soon as you come home, leave your luggage outside, bring the bag in to the washing machine, dump them in, get rid of the bag, and wash the clothes with as hot water as you can. Um, a dryer will also take care of it uh, if you've got... Um, blankets and stuff like that or, or pillows that you travel with you can stick those either wash them and or stick them in the dryer for 20 minutes but um i would really the other thing if you're in yakima and it's down to you know zero degrees if it's left in a freezer for zero degrees for three days it's bye bye to the bed bugs again you know get somebody to come in so we are just about rounding it up and we talked about how we are more than happy to help you with any kind of problems you have. Talked about how to have how to take care of any kind of insect problems you have using a, just a sensible, stepwise manner of doing it. We looked at the different ways animals uh, reproduce, the kind of life cycles they had, and then we talked about these different uh, insects that you may or may not find in your home. <laughs> and I've got a lot of resources here. And make sure you get on the website so that you can access these. And I really appreciate you coming tonight. I know you could have done just about anything else, but thank you very much.